these medals are uh, on a wall in my uh, home. And this, and some of you will be familiar uh, with that type of medal, that is my grandfather, Dennis O'Callaghan's War of Independence IRA Service Medal. So Dennis O'Callaghan farmed in Dunamore in County Cork. I don't know actually exactly what role he played in the, the fight for freedom, if we call it that. But I keep close eye on new, release, new releases excuse me, from state archives in the hope of learning more. And family lore is, is fairly innocuous on this. It's about men on the run, sheltering in the loft, that type of story. But the Dunamore IRA was in the thick of a brutal conflict. And I'm very curious about what my grandfather experienced, what he thought, what he did, what he didn't do. Uh, he didn't talk about it much, apparently. So maybe some historical record will, will fill in the blanks uh, someday on that. This is the 1916 medal. It's the 1916 medal of my wife's great granduncle, Sean O'Brien from Inishmion, uh, Ilan Oran. O'Brien was a printer in Dublin, and he fought on North King Street. And some of the fiercest fighting of the Rising took place there, and the worst atrocity probably when 16 civilians were shot or, or bayoneted to death by British soldiers. So back home in Inishmion, then, the reaction to the reaction of O'Brien's mother to the news that he had uh, joined this great rebellion points maybe to the, the variety of uh, attitudes that were uh, abroad among Irish people. Nach biog etala jane Isn't it little he has to be doing? So you can't impress some people. Uh, for my generation, this history, you know, it's, it's very far away in one way, it's intimately close in another. I didn't know these people, uh, we didn't know them, but we, we know and love people who did know and love them. So I've unanswered questions about my grandfather, but I still feel uh, a connection to him, I feel proud of the association. And many people, because family links maybe, uh, because of the history they've read or been taught at school, the stories they've been told at home, uh, the songs they've heard, whatever it might be, they feel a deep and a powerful connection to the history of the revolution. So I share that, that cultural instinct, that emotional instinct, call it what you will, to identify with the past. Does that make me biased, I wonder sometimes? Well, my defence is that all my mistakes, all the omissions, the misinterpretations, the rushes to judgement, whatever else, they've all been inconsistent. So they don't all point in the same direction. So that would be my <coughs> defence. Now, the decade of centenaries has been a central force in my professional life, at least, for more than the last 10 years. So as a student of history, I was then a kind of a jobbing historian. Before the decade of centenaries started, I was working as a tutor, a teaching assistant, part-time lecturer, all of those type of roles. Then I was fortunate enough to be a university historian in the classroom and outside. So establishing and running undergraduate and postgraduate programs, supervising students, advising community groups, getting to speak publicly, participating in media productions, researching, writing, publishing. And I'm very grateful for, uh, to have had all those opportunities and I hope that I have made a useful uh, contribution. But what have we learned from it all? What has been done well or what has been done badly? What might we have done differently? And I wonder what will future historians make of it when in 50 years and in 100 years there's, you know, reflections on, on the decade of centenaries, I suppose. Uh, one of the more memorable questions that I have been asked as a historian was whether a notorious, this was maybe roughly 10 years ago, and I was asked whether a, a particular uh, criminal of the day was really a descendant of a black and tan, a notorious figure. Is it true that such and such is a grandson of a black and tan or whatever it was? I think it was intended as a joke, but I, uh, I'm not 100% sure still. But it was rooted in the popular misconception that all of these temporary policemen were ex-convicts, that they were the dregs of Britain's penal system, that they were predisposed to violence. So the decade of centenaries was a great opportunity to root out old fallacies, to counter new myths. They often took, I think, the form of well-intentioned soundbites about shared history. But because of the commitment and the competence of local and professional historians, of local authorities and libraries, of teachers and schools, we have a much better sense now of what constitutes meaningful evidence and testimony 
And as a result, we know a lot more about the lives of, for instance, children, women, rank and file revolutionaries who uh, we wouldn't otherwise. Um, the democratisation of Irish history has been accelerated, as you know, by large scale state funded digitisation projects, and there's a solid uh, research infrastructure in place now, and there's proper value put on historical sources. So the state deserves credit for uh, sponsoring major events, for engaging communities all over the island, while for the most part setting a measured, or reflective, or respectful tone. So successes have been frequent, failures few enough, but there have been very serious missteps as well. So I'm thinking, for instance, of the ill-conceived, the unnuanced commemoration of the RIC, including by definition its black and tan uh, cadre that was pushed by the Fine Gael Minister for Justice of the day, uh, Charlie Flanagan, in early 2020. That's a prime example, I would say, not so much maybe of limits to um, inclusiveness, but just the fact that the, the notion of parity of esteem is problematic, is deeply problematic, and it's not just flawed historically, I would say. It's a political kind of apparatus or contrivance. Um, and that's, it's admirable as a, as a peacemaking tool, but it's not a method of studying the past. And Flanagan referred to policemen being murdered. So he was very clearly, he was not trying to depoliticize this. But he seemed to expect unquestioning, uncritical, uh, judgment-free, um, value-free acceptance of parity of esteem in what was a historical kind of minefield. So the vision was misguided. Some would say it was arrogant. And I think it would have undermined the importance of historical context had it materialized. I know um, Brian Hughes will address this in more detail uh, later on. But all honest brokers, I would say, probably the majority of RIC men deserved better. And the controversy, I thought, was a, a timely reminder that while reconciliation is the duty of politicians, it is not the job of historians. So I would say it was an, a missed opportunity, this, this episode. And the lesson I would take from it is that decontextualized commemoration uh, equates to bad history, simply enough. So there's a kind of continuum, I think, that glides fairly elusively from historical narrative to political uh, action. And the past can help us to disentangle uh, the complexities maybe of the present, but the past can't defend itself from those who will take liberties with uh, historical references who will manipulate history. And that is why I think the teaching and learning of history is absolutely fundamental to the well-being of democratic societies. And that's why I thought it was heartening to see sophistication in uh, in elements of the reaction to Flanagan's plan at the time. So the core junior cycle curriculum in Irish post-primary schools consists of three mandatory subjects, English, Irish, maths. Plus, after a government review of its, what it was its own terribly short-sighted omission, special status history. So the curriculum identifies key skills and it makes uh, statements of learning, so-called, about the importance of the relationship between past and current affairs. But only t history teaches us how really to connect the past and the present. And if we lose that skill and the knowledge um, on which it is based, how do we recognize fake history? And sometimes the reminders of the democratic importance of an informed, historically literate, not just interested, but literate electorate, sometimes come too late. And I'm thinking of Brexit, and all of that happened while the Irish government was playing a kind of uh, hokey-pokey with history in, in secondary schools. Is it in or is it out? And it's kind of halfway uh, in and out now still. Uh, personally, and I took the brief very literally, Matt, you asked for personal reflections, very, very literal. Uh, highlights of the decade for me in, in, included earlier this year visiting my son's school to talk about the work of, his, of a historian. And the lesson I learned that day was don't take yourself too seriously. Okay. Uh, other highlights, you know, wading through archives, occasionally you, you, you find a, a highlight. So just a couple of those. And I've written about this one before. Uh, on April the 1st, 1922, the new uh, National Army, the pro-treaty National Army, ill-prepared as they were to take control of Limerick after the British had evacuated because of the strength of the anti-treaty IRA in the city. They complained to British Army General Headquarters 
that after however long there had been um, Crown forces in Limerick, they complained that the last British soldiers had left the city too soon. And this was on the 1st of April. It wasn't a, fool, a, fool day, a fool's day excuse me, joke. But I laughed a little bit when I read it. So, you know, Honig our law, Akvishero Lua. You know, it, it came eventually and they weren't ready. Uh, another uh, thing that I found interesting or bizarre. The IRA's preoccupation with dog licenses during the Civil War. <laughs> now, there's a re real logic to it. The idea was we cannot win this war militarily. We will try to bankrupt the state and undermine the state that way. So we'll stop them collecting taxes, we'll collect our own, and so on. They printed thousands of dog licenses, thousands and thousands of them. Uh, so it's all rational, but, you know, elements of it were incongruous. So there was a notice posted in County Limerick in March 1923 reading that for every Republican shot, two staters will fall, two free staters, fair enough. It's grim and a reflection of the seriousness of the, the time. And the next line was that any dog for which license has not been paid will be put to death. So we'll put free staters to death and we'll shoot your dog if you don't have a license. So some things um, don't quite add up. Uh, the final case I want to raise is that of Joseph Tracy. <coughs> so all countries need heroes. <coughs> Excuse me. And the image of the freedom fighter has a prominent place in the public or the popular memory, whatever you want to call it, of the revolution. And the psychological power of guerrilla warfare took a hold of public opinion in Ireland in 1920, 1921, and volunteers swiftly attained a kind of legendary status almost. So every one of our little fights or attacks was significant, said Ernie O'Malley. They made panoramic pictures of the struggle in the people's eyes and lived on in their minds, and they live on still, I think. In late 2021, the West Limerick Old IRA Memorial Committee produced a booklet, a fine booklet, to mark the centenary of the death of Brigadier Sean Finn. It emphasises, uh, quote, the courage and self-sacrifice, end quote, of Finn and his comrades, and the committee hope it, uh, these are the words of the committee, it will go some way towards perpetuating the memory of a true patriot who had so much to give to his community and his country. It suggests that what is memorialised in a community can define the spirit of the people, the booklet says. I think this is really interesting stuff. And the memorial, according to, uh, uh, the memorial to Finn, according to the booklet, will stand there for generations to come on a high sloping field as a testimony to the idealism and courage of a young man who was prepared to make the supreme sacrifice for the cause in which he believed, and also to the commitment of the people of West Limerick to ensure that he will always be remembered. Well, to the, to the committee at least, isn't it? Um, what about those revolutionaries who only sacrificed and suffered and won no glory? And some of Limerick's revolutionaries were forgotten very quickly. So this man, Joseph Tracy, uh, he made applications to the, uh, under the Army Pension and the Military Service Pensions Acts. Uh, it's the only place I've ever seen him mentioned. Never seen him, I don't think, in a newspaper. There's no memorials to him or anything like that. Um, so there's little snapshots of his difficult life, the chaotic life that he lived after he had served with the 2nd Battalion of the Mid Limerick Brigade and uh, at the time of his death in the 1960s. So in his own words, he lost his mind after a beating from Crown Forces in March 1921, and he spent six months in the Limerick District Lunatic Asylum. He fought in the Civil War uh, with the IRA before he was hospitalised again in late 1922 due to what he called a nervous breakdown. In 1924, then, he, uh, he made a claim for a wound pension uh, that was denied by the Free State. He had no fixed address or no income at the time. So ex-servicemen who were suffering from shell shock were commonly diagnosed with uh, neurasthenia. And the Army Medical Board diagnosed uh, Tracy with traumatic neurasthenia. So, description of his symptoms. Sleeplessness and pain in the head. Gets about three and a half hours broken sleep per night. All jerks. Tremor of extended hands, very marked. Walks with difficulty on a straight line, inattentive. Symptoms suggest neurasthenia. Uh, in 1934, then, he was homeless, destitute. And a pension branch official reviewing another letter from him. 
Maybe this official was overwhelmed by, you know, the hard stories that he read every day. He callously dismissed Tracy as, and this is a quote, naked and good for nothing but for the scrap heap like every other human machine. Uh, in 1939, Tracy was living in a billiards room at Bank Place in the city. Uh, James O'Mahony then petitioned the Minister for Defence, Oscar Trainer. Uh, himself obviously trainer a veteran of the revolution so at least this O'Mahony was friendly enough you'd like to think with um, uh, Tracy to, to look out for him. Coupled with his condition this state of affairs is rapidly undermining his health and if allowed to continue will send to an early grave one who has given the best years of his life in the service of his country. In 1940 then Tracy himself wrote to trainer I am a most unfortunate case I have not a copper to my name or no one to give it to me because I cannot approach my friends who have been so good to me in the past. I live in an old cellar and for long periods without food or clothes until charitable people come to my aid. So he stayed at Bank Place throughout the 1940s. In 1951, a doctor certified him as suffering from general debility and chronic bronchitis and emphysema. The Army Pensions Board gave a little bit more detail. They elaborated. Complains of continuous noise in left ear, sometimes both ears, gets dizzy and falls, does not get sufficient to eat, as he is only 11 shillings per week for food, not well nourished, mental condition poor, and on and on it goes. So the diagnosis was of an inadequate psychopathic personality. He was thin and wasted. He was incapable of self-support by reason of permanent infirmity. He had to move from his residence and bank place in 1951 because it was to be demolished. Until 1967 then, he made his home in rent-free accommodation at Corn Market Row. That was listed, so from 1951 he lived there. In 1957 it was listed as unfit for human occupation. It wasn't condemned for another decade. And at the time of his death in 1968, Tracy was living in a hostel in St. John's Square. So 1968 is what? It's uh, 55 years ago. There might be someone around Limerick who remembers him. Uh, I hope someone else speaks about him again uh, in the future. So we're nearing the end of the decade of centenaries. What happens next? <clears throat> well, I have a feeling that the show will go on actually a little bit. The Atlas of the Civil War, for instance, will appear in shops apparently just before Christmas 2024. And uh, old battles will, will no doubt be refought on its pages. In many other ways, we've moved on from old divisions. So Cork Council recently erected a statue of Michael Collins on the Grand Parade. It was unveiled just in October, actually. Michael Collins, hero or traitor? The man who won the war against the British or the man who betrayed the Republic? And or, probably. Okay. Uh, the statue is based on this iconic photograph of, of uh, Collins with the, Pierce, with the bicycle at the Pierce uh, factory in Wexford. The statue, interestingly enough, there's lots of interesting things about this, but one of them, I think, is that it was unveiled by Jimmy Barry Murphy, by Ronan O'Gara, and by Rena Buckley. Not a politician in sight. <clears throat> and everyone in Cork, at least, loves those three people. Okay? Uh, traditionally, anti-treatyites, <clears throat> those who wrapped the green flag around themselves might have voiced some opposition or might have had a grievance about this. No historical concern has emerged from the green side. The only grumbles, apparently, have come from the motoring lobby, who object not to the location of the monument, it's on a footpath and grand parade, uh, it doesn't affect traffic, they object to the bicycle. So, in 2023, Michael Collins is less divisive than his bicycle. And for a man, for a person, myself, a historian, who spent an awful lot of time trying to understand the cycle of violence uh, and all of this in the revolution, uh, it's hard to know uh, what to think uh, about that. Uh, so listen, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and I look forward to listening to Tom Toomey. Thank you. <laughs>